So thank you. So it's a pleasure to be here, and um, I will I will start right away to to talk about uh, the topic of today, the mini course uh, from imaging to mesoscopic physics and back. So first, I want to give some uh, maybe some uh, very general books, which can be uh, which can be useful uh, um, as a background for this, uh, for those interested to to go deeper. So oops, the first one is uh, oops, sorry. Mesoscopic Physics of Electrons and Phonons, which maybe some of you know, uh, by Ackermans and Montembeau. And also a very nice book is this uh, Joe Goodman book, which is very famous for Fourier optics, but also for statistical optics. And he has a, a, a full book about speckle, which, I, uh, which is very nice. And uh, the, talk, the, the topic I will talk about today is about wavefront shaping, and it's quite new, it's about 10 years old. And so there's not really a book, actually there's an upcoming book, but it's not yet out. Uh, so I can recommend two nice review articles that are very good to orient yourself uh, into this uh, very active field at the moment. Uh, so one from 2012 and one a bit more recent and a bit more towards imaging from 2015, both in Nature Photonics. And I will base most of what I say today, uh, uh, and it's also a little bit of advertisement, about, uh, uh, on a review paper that I wrote with my colleague Stefan Rotter. Uh, about uh, light field in complex media from mesoscopic scattering to wave control, uh, which uh, is just a few months old. Okay, so the lecture, uh, I just want to put the, the, the summary of the lecture of today and next week. The, today I will try to speak about uh, more non-mesoscopic phenomena, uh, about light scattering, so try to reintroduce for those who are not uh, uh, familiar with it, uh, transport in disordered media, diffusion equation, and also a fundamental tool for us, which will be speckle, uh, and to introduce a, a set of uh, wavefront control experiments that have been developed in the last 10 years. So trying to show how you can go from adaptive optics that is used in astronomy to wavefront shaping, which are, is now used in, in complex media, and introduce different techniques of transmission matrix, optimization, phase conjugation, and also, if time allows, to speak about uh, temporal control. And next week, I will uh, dig into uh, more the uh, pure uh, mesoscopic effects that arise in disordered media, uh, such as uh, weak and strong localization, open and closed channels, uh, speckle correlations, and so on. Uh, and I will then go back to imaging to show how some of these concepts have been developed and have been useful for applications, uh, for instance, for imaging and also for uh, random lasers or to study the open and closed channels. So this would be uh, the topic of these, two, uh, of these two courses. Okay, so now for the first one, I want to discuss about scattering, and this is a, a picture by Turner, uh, that, uh, where you can see really the, the, all uh, the shades of colors and the very subtle uh, uh, shades of, of light that, that appear in this picture, and this is really what uh, scattering is about. But um, if, if uh, the scattering is all around us, in, uh, in clouds, in snow, in biological tissue. So you have the, the hands of the kid which, which lets, lets some light passes through and it's really a, a, a scattering phenomenon in the, in the tissue. And it's really due to the fact of, that the medium is heterogeneous, so light doesn't go a straight line and, and has a very complex uh, path that I will, I will describe. And of course, the conventional uh, way to treat scattering is to say that it's a problem, and I'm just looking at the light that is not scattered or not absorbed. This is the Bear Lambert law, exponential decay of the unscattered or unabsorbed light, uh, and uh, which you see a laser that is decreasing exponentially as it propagates inside this. It's a tank of water with a little bit of milk, so you see the diffusive halo, and th this is uh, decreasing exponentially. So I'm not interested in the ballistic part, I will talk a little bit about it, but I'm more interested about this halo and what it teaches us. Okay, so I need to go back to the basics and re-explain uh, what happens when light encounters a small particle. So if I have a, a particle like that and I have a light beam coming on it, I can take just a geometrical picture if the, if the particle is big. I have a section A, which this particle uh, um, has uh, in the direction of the light. So I have basically a, a, a cross section for the light. So the cross section would be pi A, pi a squared if the particle is of radius A. And uh, this will tell me basically the deviation of the, of the light rays. 
And, but what is missing there is basically the, it's just deviation. So I'm missing the reflection on the, on the, on the interfaces. And I'm also missing the interferences and the, the wave uh, picture. But still, it's actually quite a good approximation for large particles. So now if I go to very small particles, much smaller than the wavelengths, well, I know that uh, the light uh, wave will induce basically a, a, an electric dipole that will oscillate. And then this, this oscillation of this di dipole will scatter. And then the behavior is completely different. And I will have a radiation pattern. So I will have a scattering diagram, which is a typical scattering di diagram of the dipole with lobes depending on the uh, direction of the electric field. And if I look into uh, uh, the right plane, I have basically isotropic uh, distribution, uh, isotropic scattering. So if I take a 10 nanometer uh, particle for uh, lambda um, in the red, well, I will have an isotropic scattering. But interestingly, if I look at the cross section, OK, I see that this cross section is actually very small. Since the particle is smaller than the wavelengths, the, cro the effective cross section is, uh, is uh, several orders of magnitude, so almost six smaller than the effective uh, uh, geometrical cross section of the particle because it's not resonant, it's very small. So now we'll try to go between these two extremes and try to increase the size of the particle. So if I take a particle of now, uh, so this is 10 nanometer and this is the cross section, and A is the physical cross section. So if I now go to 100 nanometer, so about one sixth of the wavelength, you see that now the scattering, because not, not as much isotropic, but a little bit forward scattering. So this is the forward direction and a bit less in the backward direction. And the cross section increase a little bit. So now I'm just um, about, about equal. So I have about the same cross section optically than, physic than the, the, the physical cross section. And now if I increase, so if I go to a particle which is about about the wavelengths, so I'm almost matched here. Well, you can see that I have a very strongly forward scattering radiation pattern. And if I look at the cross section, you can see that the, the effic effective cross section for the light is actually one order of magnitude larger than the physical cross section for the particle. So it's actually resonant and forward scattering. And if I increase a, uh, a bit more, well, I still have a very complicated radiation pattern because of the, the, B, the, the particle is, um, is uh, reacting in a very complex way. And this is completely well described by so-called Mie theory. And you see the cross section is now about the same size again. So if I now summarize, this tells me that the scattering cross section as a function of the relative radius of the particle to the wavelength is actually very small for the, when the particle is very small. This is the Rayleigh scattering. And then you have some resonances that depends on, on the index of the particle. And then it oscillates. And here you reach a plateau, which is more or less the geometrical uh, factor, the geometrical uh, cross section. OK? So now to summarize, I send light on a particle. I have scattering. I have uh, some uh, non unscattered light that continues forward that is slightly attenuated. And I have a cross section, absorption, and a scattering radiation pattern. So now, if I have many of these particles, then I start to have some very complicated pattern for light to, to follow. And I have um, so -called multiple, the, the so -called, I enter the so-called multiple scattering regime. OK. And I like also this picture to illustrate these different regimes. So you have the sky. The, the, dire the direct light of the, sc sc of, the, of the sun is the ballistic light. OK. Uh, the blue color of the, of the sky is the Rayleigh light. So you all know that it's blue because it scatter more the blue than the red because of this uh, lambda over R uh, um, problem, uh, the relationship. And if I now move to this cloud, well, you, then you have multiple scattering. And then I still have, I have it's, it now becomes wavelength independent. So it becomes very white. Uh, and also very diffusive. So this is why you have this typical uh, whitish uh, haze of, of clouds. And if I go to this, this regime here, you can see that here, the, the cloud appears very, very dark. And it's dark not because it's absorbing, but because it's so thick that the light actually doesn't go through. But light is mostly reflected on the other side. So the dark is not absorption. It's just basically optical thickness. OK? 
So uh, to summarize so far, if I have a, this is my ballistic light attenuated, and this is what happened at the microscopic scale. So now I will try to describe how you, when you want to describe this kind of phenomena, how, you, how, how do you do it? So what you normally do is uh, you have the so-called radiative transfer equation where you basically describe light uh, by basically uh, the flow of energy it has inside this, this uh, scattering structure. So you can write uh, basically a quantity which is a specific intensity uh, and the flux of energy, which is an amount of energy in a specific direction, okay? And then what you can write is you can write some kind of radiative transfer equation that tells you that the variation of the, 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 uh, the intensity in a specific direction is basically uh, the, the effect of scattering and absorption by this volume plus a term that is the light that is coming from other direction and that is scattered in this particular direction. So it's basically some kind of conservation of energy uh, in a scattering medium with scattering, with scattering. So of course the, the, the absorption is here in the, in the loss but not in the, in the gain part for this specific intensity. Uh, so now you can go, this is really at the microscopic scale where you really care about the direction of the energy. Oops. But if, uh, you, if you are in a slightly larger scale and you don't really care about that, then you can basically uh, just uh, worry about the, the density of energy without caring about, the, the, with, without caring about actually in which direction the energy flow at, a at, the, at this scale. And then you end up having to care about the density of the energy U, and you have a diffusion equation, which, which is now uh, just a Fourier or phi clo uh, for the energy of light inside this tissue. So this phi clo is, of course, very general because it also ap uh, uh, appears in uh, thermal conductivity and so on and so forth. So this is a very, a very general phenomenon. And you can, you can uh, introduce a, a diffusion coefficient for the light which is uh, linked to the transport mean free pass, which is basically this quantity that describes uh, how, how much you have to flow before being isotropically uh, scattered. Okay, so there is another way to look at it, and it's actually more like a, 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 stick, and, uh, a stick approach where you consider light as a, as a pass and, and you try to, tr to, to describe it as a trajectory for the light rays. And in this case, uh, you can basically model it as a, as a random walk of the, of the energy in, uh, in the scattering medium. And this is just a very simple model to show you that you, happen, you, you, come, you come back with the same, uh, the same kind of equation. So if you, take, if you make n random steps and each step is about the transport mean free pass of your transport phenomenon, well, you end up, um, you end up with exactly the same uh, equation at the end. You the, the mean square displacement, if you do n step, is about square root of n uh, distance away, time, time the, the step length, away from, from the origin. So you end up exactly with the same kind of equation. And I will use this picture a little bit later on to, to uh, describe the interference pattern. But this is just uh, typically what you do if you try to model the system with a Monte Carlo simulation, for instance. Okay. By the way, I forgot to say, but if you have any question or if you want any details, feel free to interrupt. Okay, so there is some interesting phenomenon and I, I will try to do uh, when I can some uh, analogy between uh, light in disordered medium, media and also other kind of uh, wave in disordered media. And in particular, there is a beautiful analogy which is basically uh, that you can do an analogy between light in a disordered medium and electron in a metallic uh, wire. And you have actually uh, uh, an, an analog of the Ohm's law in the optical domain. So if you shine light on a scattering medium and you look at the total transmission, you can show that the total transmission is actually proportional to the inverse of the thickness. So uh, and the, the proportionality factor is exactly the transport mean free pass. So in a way, uh, it means that if you double the thickness, you will just divide by two the total transmission. So of course, I've told you before that the ballistic light is exponentially attenuated. So doubling the thickness 
diminish drastically the ballistic light, but it only diminished by a simple factor two, the total transmission. So uh, that's some interesting experiment that measure that. But this is exactly the equivalent of Ohm's law. So I have a resistivity for my, the conductivity of my optical energy and doubling, doubling the thickness, just divide by two the, tr the transmission, the flow of light. Okay. Uh, there is also an inter it's also interesting to look in the time domain. So if I send a very short uh, pulse of light inside a medium, well, because of this random walk statistics, uh, the amount of light that reach uh, the other side has a distribution of fast. So of course, it's very unlikely that last light have gone in straight line to the other side. So it can have uh, lived quite a long time inside the, the medium before exiting. And, and now I can show that the, 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 the light that comes out is basically broadened in time. And uh, if you double the thickness, the basically the, the, this time quadruple is, and you can still interpret that completely, uh, understand it completely in terms of uh, random walks. Okay, so if I want to go twice as far, I need four times more steps. Okay. Um, okay, and, and of course the scaling parameter is again the diffusivity here. Yes? I have maybe a specific question. Where does the energy go? Because if, you, if your transmission which is reduced. Yes. The, the flow of energy has to go somewhere. So does it go, goes back or? Yes, so okay. it's exactly like, uh, so that's a very important question actually. It's exactly like a cloud. So if the cloud appear dark from the backside, from the bottom, it means it's actually, uh, it's actually uh, very bright from the upside. So it's, the light is reflected by the cloud toward the sky, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, just like if I, if I paint a wall, so paint, white paint on the wall is a very, very scattering structure mm -hmm. and uh, the wall appear white because everything that comes in comes out. So if you, if you put a very thin layer of paint on your wall and the behind it's, uh, it's black, the wall will appear gray because light will pass, will pass through. Is it, is it really in this case the, uh, the analog of Ohm's law in the sense that in Ohm's law there is a dissipation associated with the, with the diffusion of, of momentum and here uh, um, it seems to be related to a power dissipation. Uh, that's an excellent point. I, uh, I, uh, I, I, I guess, okay, I'm not sure how far the analogy goes. It's, a, it's an excellent point. I think it's, you can see it as a, a, in a way as a friction force. Okay. I would say that in this case, the, the energy is not dissipated, but more um, scattered in, in other direction, while in a, indeed in a, in a conductor it's absorbed. So, okay. and, and it's re-emitted as heat. So, but uh, I agree, the, 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 but, but the, the, the behavior is exactly the same. The scaling law is exactly the same. So this is why, this is why it's called Ohm's law, in, yeah, optical Ohm's law. But I agree, that's an interesting point. Okay, so summary so far. If I have a scattering medium, I can define a scattering mean free pass, which is the distance between the scatterer. And so it, it depends on the density of scatterer and the cross-section of the scatterer. As, as I show you, the size and the shape of the scatterer will determine how the scattering occurs. Is it forward? Is it isotropic? And so on. And this is characterized normally by the so-called anisotropy factor, G. Uh, so, and the G is defined as, as the average of the cosine theta, where theta is the angle of scattering. So if I have an isotropic scatterer, G is of the, uh, uh, forward scattering, sorry, G of the order of one, because theta is mostly close to zero, and if I have isotropic scattering, then G is equal to zero because it's, uh, it, it balances out, okay? And from these two parameters, I can retrieve the transport mean free pass, which is this macroscopic quantity that determines the transport of energy. And the transport mean free pass is related to these two quantities by LS over one minus G. So if G equals zero, so if the scattering is, is isotropic, then the transport mean free pass is exactly the scattering mean free pass, the distance between the scattering events. If G is close to one, then one minus G is close to zero, and the transport mean free pass can be very long. So for instance, if I have forward scattering and G of the order of 0.9, that, which is kind of typical, for instance, for tissues, for uh, biological tissues, then the transport mean free pass is about 10 times larger than the scattering mean free pass. Okay, so now I, I jump to, the, to another uh, view of, of this phenomenon, 
which is a wave picture and, a, and, a, and an interference picture. So um, I, I want to remind you that this scattering remain a coherent process. So just like if I send a wave on a, on a screen with two holes, I have some interferences. If I shine a laser, a coherent laser on a scattering uh, sample, I have a speckle. And this speckle will be the result of this uh, random walk, this transport inside the tissue, inside, inside the scattering medium. And I want to show you some examples, but I have a problem to show them like that. So I will need just to show them like to you here. Okay. So now you have here a, a plane wave that arrives and here I have one scatterer. Okay, so what happened? The wave arrives and when it hits the scatterer, the scatterer will radiate isotropically because it's a very small scatterer. So you see, the, you can't see, but the ballistic light is slightly attenuated and I have an isotropic uh, spherical wave coming from this scatterer. Oops, now I'm, I'm ruining my effects. Uh, Sorry. Okay, so now, as you can see, I have a wave that will come on a few scatterers. So now I'm in a regime where each scatterer will scatter light and re-emit a spherical wave, but you will see that in the end, I'm more in a single scattering regime. So each of the waves re emit a, a signal. And if you look uh, uh, closely, you can see some second order rebound. Okay, so you can see some second order rebound and you can start to see this interference appear between the scattering events. Okay, oops. So now I will try to go to put more scatterer. Okay, and now you will see that now we're really in a regime where the scattering uh, starts to be quite complicated and all the waves start to rebound and I start to have some very complicated spatial and temporal uh, interference patterns. So of course it's, a, it's not a monochromatic view, it's really a, a space and time view, but it illustrates this very complicated uh, pulse, uh, pulse e uh, effect of the light on the pulse. And now I will show you an extreme case. By the way, I, for, I forgot, but these movies are made by my colleague uh, uh, Emmanuel Bossi uh, at uh, now uh, University of Grenoble. And he kindly uh, uh, let me uh, use them. Uh, and they are made originally for acoustics. So it's a basically 2D acoustics, but it, it illustrates what I want to say very well. Uh, so now I again have a, a, a wave coming from the left. Each of those is a scatterer, and now you will observe that the ballistic light will be strongly attenuated, so the, this uh, ballistic front will decrease very strongly and at some point completely disappear, and you will see that the, the, the light will stay very long, much longer than just the, the first passage of this uh, ballistic light inside the medium and very, very slowly decay. So there, in, in this case, in a way, I didn't change the, uh, the size of the system, but I changed the scattering strengths. So you can observe really this very complicated phenomenon. The ballistic light decreases, so you can't see it at all. And now the energy lives for a very long time. So if you think in terms of uh, trajectories, you have a very, very long uh, random walk, uh, if I may, inside this sample before it really slowly decays. So you retrieve here the, and, and now it's, it's uh, uh, so the total energy has been mostly reflected, but now after a long time, you can see that light goes equally in both directions. So it also probably answers your question. Okay. Okay, so now I want to focus on this interference pattern that you just observed, but really in a, in a monochromatic way. So it's not a pulsed experiment I want to discuss, but really when I shine a, a, a continuous wave, a monochromatic wave. 
And I, I urge anyone that uh, is interested by this to read this beautiful paper by uh, Joseph Goodman. So he's the guy who wrote this book. And this paper contains more or less every, all the physics, and it's absolutely beautiful. And, um, and everything is in the abstract, but I, I won't uh, go through it. I will actually uh, describe it uh, uh, step by step. So what happened? When I shine light on a complicated medium, so in the case of this, of this uh, uh, article, the complicated medium is a rough surface, but the, the, the phenomenon of speckle formation is actually universal. So it doesn't depend for monochromatic light whether it's a surface or a volume. So everything remains valid. So I shine light on volume or surface, and then I will consider in one observation point what happened. And what happened in one observation point is that light will be reflected or scattered in the medium, and then we'll reach this, uh, this detector. And in a, and each point, we'll have this very, the, an image would have this granular structure because each point receives light from all the points of the surface, but with a, a random uh, phase because the surface is rough or the medium is volumetric and the light that exits at some point has a specific amplitude and phase that is very complicated. So I can understand the light in one point as a sum of many contributions uh, with random phases. So uh, in a way, it's again the result, the total intensity in one point is again the result of a, of a random walk, but it's not anymore a physical random walk of light inside the medium. It's like a, a, a random walk of a sum of many, many contributions that form a total intensity uh, that is the sum of this, all these contributions, all this sum of phasors. And then I have a, a very, very universal and uh, completely general result that the intensity distribution of this, although this is very, very complicated and cannot be really predicted very well, this is ex the, the statistical properties are completely known, okay? And the first one is the intensity distribution. If you look at this picture and just plot the histogram of the intensity, you would just see something like that. So the probability of having a certain intensity is exponentially decreasing and it follows exactly that. So it's uh, I bar would be the mean intensity and the probability of, of having a certain intensity is I is one over I bar exponential minus I over I bar. And that's it. And zero otherwise. And there is a, also a nice property that if you look at the statistics of this, you see that the contrast defined as, the, as uh, sigma I over I is unity. Exactly. Okay. So this is true for a pattern which is polarized, and I will discuss later on what happens when you take into account the polarization. So now, if you sum uncorrelated speckle, for instance, if uh, you, you take an image coming by shining several lasers, well, you, the mean intensity will be multiplied by m, but the variance will actually not evolve the same way because you're adding an uh, uh, independent process so the variance actually goes as square root of m, where m is the number of speckles that you add, which means that the contrast will evolve as one over square root of m. So it's interesting because this also explains you why if you shine incoherent light on a scattering system, like on a, on a wall, for instance, well, incoherent light means many, many contribution, spectral or spatial contribution, each of them give, give an independent speckle. So the sum of this speckle uh, as is basically a, a, a homogeneous because you reduce the contrast by a lot. But just a, a simple example is if you now look at the polarization, so, and you shine light on a scattering system, light will give you two speckles for each polarization, and this speckle will be uncorrelated. So just if you put your camera in front and looking at the speckle coming from a scattering medium, and you put a polarizer, you will have exactly this with a contrast of one. And if you remove the polarizer, you will have a sum of two speckles and the contrast will be reduced by one square root of two. Okay? And the other important point, still looking at this picture, is the size of the grain. So now I zoom and you can see that the size is, not, uh, is, actually, well, is actually well defined. It's not, you don't have any distribution of size. You have a well defined size of the, of the grain of, in speckle. And this, uh, this size, actually come from the fact that uh, the rays forming in one point are formed within a cone. So 
in a way, if I'm looking in one observation point at the light coming from a scattering system, I have a finite uh, aperture of all the rays forming this speckle. And this will actually uh, mean that there is some kind of correlation that is exactly the equivalent of the numerical aperture of the lens. So it's exactly the same size as a focal spot of a, of a lens, which would form the, a spot with the same angle. So in a way, the size of the speckle is exactly diffraction. So I have basically many, 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 many grains which, whose intensity is, is, um, uh, is uh, distributed uh, according to the, to the exponential, negative exponential. And each grain has a very well-defined size, statistically speaking. Okay. So just coming back uh, to this, uh, the fact that now if I don't have a monochromatic light but a polychromatic light and I send a short pulse and it will give me an elongated pulse after my medium, well, uh, 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 another way to look at that is to say that in a way it means that the speckle will depend on the, on the, on the, uh, on the wavelength. So the speckle will depend on how long the light stay inside the medium. Okay, and the spectral bandwidth, which, which means by how much I need to change my wavelengths to see a change in the speckle, will be related to this dwell time, to this broadening of my, due to my medium. Okay, and an interesting uh, thing is also that uh, uh, if you add all this incoherent speckle, you have a lower contrast. And just an anecdote, for those who have already played with uh, femtosecond lasers, who has already played with femtosecond lasers? Maybe not so many. So just, so if you have a femtosecond laser, uh, a femtosecond laser is basically many, many frequencies of light that can either be uh, locked together or not, okay? And an interesting way uh, that you can check whether your laser is locked or not is to basically look at the speckle from the light on, on the wall. And what you will see is when the laser is not locked, your laser becomes very narrow and you will have a nice speckle. And as soon as your speckle disappears, you know that your, your laser is locked because it means that you have a broad uh, spectrum and your, and your uh, speckle disappear. Okay, so uh, to summarize so far, the, this speckle figure that you observe uh, through a scattering medium is basically for monochromatic light constituted of many, many speckle grains. Each speckle grain is a sum of many paths with random phases. Uh, the size is limited by diffraction and unpolarized speckle means you have two orthogonal speckle independent with each other. You also have many interesting phenomena in speckles such as vortices, singularities and so on, but I will not uh, and, uh, discuss them today. And you have this spectral uh, behavior of the speckle, which is also very interesting. So now I'm coming to the imaging part and how we can exploit these different tools for imaging. And I want to illustrate that in this picture where you have this, uh, this uh, just a photo taken in the, in the fog and you have a character in the forefront. So this person is very easy to see because it's ballistic light, okay? So I, I have the, the, the spatial information. Now you can see some people in the foreground and they're hard to see because there's little ballistic light that goes through them and back. So they have been exponentially attenuated. And now the problem is if you look there, there is only scattered light. So the question we'll try to uh, tackle in the second part of this course, and I try to be brief because I see time is flying, that it, it's, very, it's not completely impossible to recover some special information about with scattered light, okay? Uh, okay, so I've, I've already said that light is exponentially attenuated. And so if you look at all the microscopy imaging techniques that are uh, investigated to uh, image in depth in scattering tissue, uh, in scattering media, you can see that there is some kind of um, scaling law. So the penetration depth and uh, the, the resolution and the penetration depths are linked. So in a way, if you want to image at very high resolution uh, something transparent or at the surface of something scattering, it's easy. You have plenty of techniques that allow that. Low, high resolution, low depths. So you don't need to care about all these techniques. Some of you may know them. Uh, SPIM, confocal, two-photon microscopy, OCT, uh, and so on. And then you can go deeper, so you can try to image really deep into the tissue uh, or into the scattering medium, but then you have very, very low resolution. So it's like it's the technique called diffusive imaging. 
So in a way, uh, uh, there's no way normally to recover high resolution at depths. And I will try to show you some techniques that are able to do that. Okay, so this is just an example of uh, all the techniques that allows you to recover image at depth, and it's just illustrative. So I'm just citing, I'm just showing three examples of uh, two photon microscopy, optical coherence tomography, or confocal microscopy. So for those of you who know them, you know, you will recognize uh, what you see. But for all the others, what you, the, the take home message is these techniques are basically trying very hard to recover the ballistic photons. Okay? And of course, because it's uh, exponentially decreasing, uh, it's actually uh, very difficult to go deep, okay? So, uh, and this is a, an interesting, uh, okay, I don't need to explain this to physicists, but if you take uh, five centimeters of tissues, and if you, if, you, if you plug the scattering uh, properties of tissues, you will see that af even if you send one watt, you will have one photon every billion years uh, at, the, at the exit of ballistic photons, of course. But th there will be actually plenty of scattered photons. Okay, so one way to deal with inhomogeneities is um, uh, we know how to deal when perturbations are small. So this is the domain of uh, adaptive optics and wavefront uh, perturbation. So for instance, if I have the atmosphere, I know that I'm able to uh, the, the atmosphere will perturb the, the, an image. For instance, if I'm trying to look at the star, at st stars from the, from the ground, I will see this because the atmosphere is perturbating. And this is another example is the A, eye. So if I try to see, to look at the, the, the back of my eye, I will have some perturbation because my, my eye is not perfect. And the, the higher the pupil of my eye, is op my, the pupil is open, the higher the aberration. So actually at night, your eye open to let more light in, but your resolution, uh, the resolution of your vision decrease a lot. Okay, this is because your eye is not perfect. So if your eye is very open, seven millimeter pupil, the, the, the diffraction spot should be very small. And that's actually what you have because the eye is not perfect. So the conventional way to deal with that exists since the 50s. And this is called adaptive optics. So you have perturbated waves that arrive from your optical system, and you have a correction device that is able to compensate and recover a flat wavefront. Flat wavefront means you can form a diffraction limited image. So what you do is basically you measure the wavefront with a wavefront sensor, and then you, you feed back on the mirror to uh, close loop to uh, compensate the wavefront and have uh, something flat. And, and, and then you have a, a good image quality. So this is used in telescopes, and this is used in microscopy, and this is two examples, one in the eye. This is the, what you see when you try to look with an imaging system to the back of your eyes. You, you can't see the, 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 the individual receptor, and this is what you see when you have this uh, correction to have a perfect imaging system. And this is an image from a, from a telescope when you try to do some spectroscopy on a star. You really want to have this uh, very bright spot to be, uh, to be sensitive. Okay, so what people are using for this is deformable mirror. They are able to correct weak aberrations. Yes? Quel est l'intérêt de vouloir modifier la forme des miroirs si on connaît la procédure qui fait qu'on va récupérer la, la lumière de façon correcte ensuite Est-ce que ce n'est pas plus simple simplement de prendre la lumière qui est déformée et oui. d'appliquer une, une opération software directement sur cette lumière Ok, so should I answer in English or in French Okay, so uh, maybe, maybe in English for, for, you know, for history. Uh, so the, the, the question is about why, why to correct and not just to measure. So actually, this is, there is a trend to do that. In, uh, this is what is called computational imaging, where you want to basically uh, have the simplest uh, optical system and then do some uh, numerical um, correction or um, computation later on to recover the image. That's possible. It's not always possible physically. For instance, if you, have a, if you want a fast uh, detection, you need a small detector. Or if you have a spectrometer, you need to enter into a slit of a spectrometer. So you, you want to really recover physically this resolution to, to have more signal or more uh, spectral or spatial resolution. So it's not always possible to do that, but it's a, it's a way. You can, you can, in some cases, you can avoid it. 
So what I will describe today is uh, somehow how this concept of compensating the dispersion or the, the aberration of a, of a system can be extended to what I was discussing until now, which is this complex media, scattering system. So this is what is done with special light modulators. And special light modulators is just that what you, what you have in these beamers, it's, a, it's an array of pixels, and it is, this array of pixels gives you a million uh, degrees of freedom to modulate the amplitude or the phase of the light. So you, can, you have now a very, compared to this deformable mirror that have just a few actuators, and that are not able at all to tackle the complexity of scattering or the speckle, you can really do something much more uh, complicated. And then uh, uh, scattering become a problem that you can try to tackle. Okay, and of course, I mean, as, as you mentioned, I, I was in uh, the, the Langevin Institute uh, founded by Matthias Fink, and I, I need to remind uh, what has been done in acoustics. And in acoustics, it has been shown that uh, time reversal is a very powerful tool to control wave in a scattering system. So if I have a source that emits a wave and this wave go through a, propagates through a very complex medium, well, this medium, normally the wave propagation is linear. So if I just record many, many, all, all, the, all the light, all, all the wave that comes out and I return it and I play it backwards, the light, the wave should uh, leave its life backwards and refocus on the source. So this is what was called in acoustics time reversal mirror. And in a way, most of our technique um, have a lot of analogy with this kind of, uh, of ideas. So in this case, you achieve spatial and temporal focusing on the source by just playing backward the signal that you recorded with the detector. So if you have no, no access to temporal details, so if you have a monochromatic source, and you record them on a, on, a camera, on, a, on a detector, just like, a, you know, an interference pattern on a camera, then reversing time is actually changing the sign of the phase. It's called phase conjugation. And if you do, if you phase conjugate the wave and just display the same picture, the same, the same wave, but with a, changing the sign of the phase, you will refocus on the source. So this is called a phase conjugation, and it's actually quite uh, used uh, in many different fields, like uh, laser, high power laser correction, uh, and so on. But uh, something which is important is it requires a source. It, requ it requires a source. So you need a source to produce a signal that you will face conjugate. And in this way, you get special focusing only. So I want to show you that, I mean, in the, now I, I will come to some kind of historical perspective to show you what has been done in the field in the last uh, 10 years to uh, use this kind of ideas to refocus light and, and, and manage to do some imaging through a focus. So this is an interesting uh, paper from, the, from 10 years ago from uh, Caltech, from the group of Chang Wei-Yang. So you shine light um, here on a, on, on a resolution target. This is typically used uh, to, to find the resolution of an optical system, and you image it on a CCD. So this is a relay system, and you have the image of the target on your CCD. That's what you see. And now if you put the same target and if you insert this scattering uh, sample, which is just a piece of tissue, just a, a white of chicken, chicken white. Well, this is what you see. You lose all the details and you have speckle everywhere. Okay? So what they did now was doing a, a, a so-called, um, what I would call analog optical phase conjugation. So you basically use a nonlinear crystal so that you have the wave coming and you shine, um, you shine a laser and you create an interference pattern, and this interference pattern will basically, through some nonlinear effects, re-emit the phase conjugate wave. So it's like a, a nonlinear analog process that generates a phase conjugate of a wave that, that arrives. So if you do that, and if you now you place a CCD uh, on this side, you will, the light will pass through the system again and reform the image, the original image, back on the CCD. So in a way, I shine light on, a, on an object, I record a complicated speckle through the medium, and I phase conjugate with this nonlinear crystal, and I get back the image on a camera CCD, on a CCD camera. So that's, and this is to show you the typical uh, sample they, they've done it through, up to uh, several millimeters of, uh, of, uh, of chicken, chicken breast. So very, very, of course, opaque, okay? So there is an interesting um, way to do it 
not with uh, crystals, but in a digital way. So what you can do is you can actually, instead of uh, doing it in, with a nonlinear crystal, which has lots of problems, you can basically record a hologram and play it back. So uh, how do you do that? I need to go into the details. I hope I will not uh, uh, be too complex. But you basically have light, the, 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 the light that coming from your sample that comes back, uh, that comes from your system, and that you record on a CCD camera. And then you have a plane wave from the same laser that arrives and that interfere with this speckle on your camera. So on your camera, you have this uh, speckle pattern here, but if you zoom, you see that you have some fringes. And the fringes come from the fact that you have this plane wave that gives you this interference pattern. And the position and the amplitude of the fringe tell you about the amplitude and the phase of the light of the speckle. So in a way, if you know the Fourier transform of this, you can actually spatially separate these different order of interference. And I won't enter into the details, but you can filter out uh, the information of, the, of, the, of this interferogram and recover the phase and the amplitude of the speckle. So you can really, that's, that's called basically digital holography. And you, take, you record the digital hologram of your speckle, so you record the hologram in amplitude and phase. Okay? And once you have this information, well, uh, what you can do is replace the CCD by a, special, by a digital uh, modulator and uh, display what you want, so the phase conjugate of this, of, this, uh, of this pattern, and you should be able to send it back. So this is what was done in, in this paper, still from 10 years ago. So you shine light, you focus light on a tissue, you have a speckle, and then you will try to send the phase conjugate back and get a focus. So the first step is to record a hologram. So on a CCD, you record the interference pattern between the, your speckle and a reference plane wave, okay? And in the second step, you, you play back with the, the pattern that you recorded on a special light modulator, and the special light modulator is basically matched. It's, it's, it's on, the, on both sides on of a 50-50 beam splitter. So each pixel of the SLM is matched to a pixel of the camera, and you can exactly display the right pattern, and you will send it back through the medium. And this is the result. Uh, this is the hologram that you record and you display on your phase modulator, and this is the light that you record on a camera that is placed here. So you place a camera here, and you will record, a fo and, you will, and you will see a very strong focus. So you will basically refocus light at the original point where it was coming from. Whereas if you send a, a plane wave, or if you send not the phase conjugate, but just the phase, if you forget to turn the sign, to change the sign, you will just get a, just a speckle, because like the wave will not retrace it past, its path to the source, okay? Okay, so that's nice, but you need a source. And there was this, uh, uh, another technique that was also appear, appeared at the same time that was uh, a different approach. So in this approach, you focus light through a scattering medium, but now you don't have a source, you just have a detector. So how do you do it? You shine a plane wave on a scattering medium and you record, and this is a typical speckle pattern on your camera, and then you will try to optimize the wavefront in order to recover a focus, okay? How do you do that? Well, you have to basically optimize the wavefront blindly to find the wavefront that maximizes the intensity here. And this paper was quite uh, important and, of course, very highly cited from, from the, the group of Alard Mosk in, in 20. And it's really worth to, to go through the details of, why, of how it works. Okay. So I record my, with my camera, I record the speckle, and this is what it looks like. And now I, I want to go back to this, uh, picture, this, this uh, picture I was telling you, that one speckle grain is basically many, many contribution with, uh, of random phasors, okay? So how do I do now to change this interference pattern? Well, I can, if I play with pixels of my SLM, I will change the phase of different contribution coming to this point. So this point, uh, now what I will try to do, I will play with my, the phase of my different pixel, and I will try to, oops, to, ch oops, to change uh, the phase. So what, what do I do? If I modulate one pixel of my input wavefront, 
what I will do, I will, I will deface the contribution from this pixel with all the others. So in a way, think of this sum of phasors, I will move a little phasors. So I will move one phasor and change its phase uh, between 0 and 2 pi. And if I do that, I will have an interference pattern which has a maximum if this little phasor is aligned with the average of all the others. Okay? So if I do that for this pixel and now I move pixel by pixel, well, what I will do, I will take my uh, sum of phasors, which is totally random and on average not very bright, which gives me this exponential statistics of speckle intensity, and I will make it very constructive. So what I'm doing in this case, I'm effectively, when I do that, I'm effectively aligning them all together. Okay, so slowly I put them all in phase and I increase the intensity at my point of interest until I reach an optimum, okay? So the interesting point here is that this, when, when I'm like that, when I'm at the, at the end of my optimization process, I have a very bright spot that is on average n times, about n times brighter than my original speckle. Why? Because I, I, I went from n uncorrelated step to n correlated step. So in terms of total intensity, I go from square root of n amplitude to n amplitude. So I go from n, I square it to the intensity, so I go from n to n square, so I have n times more intensity, okay? And also the interesting point is if you look at this spot, you see that it's actually very small and very well defined, and you don't see any aberrations. So the nice thing is that as I was telling you that the speckle has a very well defined correlation function, the focus that I obtain is exactly this correlation function, and this correlation is perfect. Okay, so I have a perfect and very bright, <coughs> very high signal to noise uh, diffraction limited spot through my medium. But in correct, yes. if you have two, two, two spots or two sources next to each other and you correct one, or what do you do for the other one? Sorry, do you mean two, two sources? I mean, here, here you have corrected uh, the, uh, yes. but since it's in the face, how do you know you, you have only maximized the amplitude? Density. Yes, so, so it's if you have two sources, you, have, you may have corrected for one, but how well do you do for the other? Absolutely. So here I showed you to focus on one. So I have one detector as I'm optimizing the intensity of this particular point. So if I have now two detectors, or if, I, if I'm trying to optimize the total intensity of two points, what I will get is I will get two foci, two focus, but with half the intensity. Okay, so in a way I will share my pixels or the, the effect of my pixel to these two points. So if I try to focus on many points, I will get a, it will work, but I will get a reduced efficiency by, by the, depend on the, depending on the number of points I want to optimize. So I'll, I think maybe it will become clearer uh, later on. So now, the third approach, so there's many, but this is the three class that are now uh, well established is the one that uh, we introduced, it, which is a, the so-called transmission matrix. And I dare to call it a bit more general because in a way, it's just a, a different way to look, a, a more general way to, your, to look at your system. So we have a special light modulator. So we are controlling input modes on a, on a system. We have a system of interest, which is here a very complex system. And we have a camera. But in a way, we have input, output, and in between, we have a linear system. So we have a matrix linking the input modes to the output mode, and this is what we call the transmission matrix. And I will try to show you how we can measure and exploit this transmission matrix and do exactly the same thing as the others and a bit more. So how does it look, how should it look like? If I have free space, uh, a plane wave should give me a plane, it should, should not be aberrated. So the, matrix, the transmission matrix of free space should be more or less identity. But now if I send a plane wave on a, on a scattering medium, I have a speckle. Another plane wave gives me another speckle, which has nothing to do with the first one. And then I should have something which looks very random. Okay? But this matrix will still describe the input-output relation of my system. So we introduced uh, the, the, a way to measure this matrix. And the, the basic idea is that what we want to do is we want to shine light on a system and then we want to send a, a basis of all possible modes. So we send 
we display on the SLM sequentially all possible basis, uh, a basis describing all possible modes of this system. So it could be pixel after pixel, but actually what we do is a so-called Adamar vector, which are basically also a basis, but a bit more uh, uh, better in term experimental terms. And at the output, I record the speckle, but actually the, the speckle is the intensity. So I need to measure exactly what I was doing before. I need to do holography to record <laughs> amplitude and phase of the speckle. But if I do that, if for every input mode, I record the amplitude of the speckle, I have a column of my transmission matrix and column after column, I can build a transmission matrix of my system. And the transmission matrix of my system will be a signature of the random medium, which is valid as long as the medium is stable. Okay, and uh, the, the, it's interesting to look at this matrix from a statistical point of view and look at the singular value decomposition of this matrix, which will somehow give me the channels by which the, the information flow from one side to the other. So the singular value decomposition is just uh, writing the matrix as U lambda V, where U and V are change of basis, uh, are eigenmodes of my system, input and output uh, eigen modes and lambda is a diagonal matrix where the lambda i are basically the the the, the singular vectors of of my uh, of my matrix. Okay, and there is an interesting prediction uh, about the di the distribution of the singular value if the matrix is totally random. Okay, and the, so this is something that we we measured at the time that if you look at the uh, random matrix uh, theory, it tells you that a totally uncorrelated random matrix should have a well-defined singular value distribution. And if the matrix is square in particular, it should follow something called the quarter circle law. So the distribution of the eigenvalue normalized to the average should, f should exactly follow on the quarter circle and, and be no larger than twice the average uh, singular value. So this is a well, uh, quite a good uh, proof that a transmission matrix of a complex medium is random. But I want to discuss a little bit what happens if you go beyond that. And this will allow me to uh, introduce what I will talk about next time, which will be some kind of second order uh, ex extension of that. So the, met the, measure the matrix that I measure experimentally is between a certain number of pixels of my CCD and my specialized modulator. And what I can see when I measure this kind of matrix, I can verify this, uh, basically this uh, quarter circle law, which means that, the, that my matrix looks, looks, look at, looks like as if it was totally random, okay? But it's not completely true. Uh, uh, and, and, and it means that my medium is actually a perfect mixer. Every input mode gives me an, an uncorrelated speckle. But actually there's many things beyond that. And in particular, uh, the, the prospect of measuring mesoscopic effects. So in particular, this scattering medium should have some mesoscopic uh, contribution from, for instance, open and closed mode, localized channel, maybe some effect of the disorder, and so on and so forth. So this is things that I will, that I will, that, uh, that I will touch next time, okay? So now for, for the, I will try to uh, be brief, but I will just uh, assume that my matrix is totally random, okay? So uh, when I have this matrix, I can basically do the following. I can find the, the pattern to display on my, on my special light modulator in order to focus light. And the, the, the solution is very simple. I need to display edge dagger times the target that I want. And edge dagger is actually transpose conjugate of my matrix. So it's actually exactly a phase conjugation operation. So I'm trying to phase conjugate solution to focus at a given position. And just to show you the result, this is what I observe if I shine a plane wave on my medium. I have a basically a speckle. And I can now calculate the phase mask. This color code is here, uh, gray level is phase. That will basically give me a focus on my camera, okay? And maybe this will answer your question. I can now also focus, because I don't need to reproduce a long uh, uh, optimization algorithm or move, move my source. I know exactly how to focus to any point by just changing the target position that I want, or I can focus to several positions at the same time, and then I will get basically uh, multiple foci, but with a reduced efficiency, okay? Okay, so to sum up so far, 
I just want to show you that, uh, to just show you pictures of the three foci that I can obtain with the three methods. Okay, they look very much similar, and there is a good reason for that, is that basically all methods are equivalent. So the focus that I obtain, either by, um, this is I think phase conjugation, this is optimization, and this is maybe transmission matrix, are basically the same equivalent solution. They have the same signal to noise uh, properties in terms of the scale with the number of pixels that you have. The size is always limited by diffraction, but of course, as you can see, the methods are quite different and the, the, the one you want to use depends a bit on what you want to do and the experimental constraints. Okay. Um, in the interest of time, I, prob I will probably just show you the beginning of that. Uh, and I just want to show you that beyond focusing, we can do some imaging. And that, for instance, if I shine the la a laser on my special light modulator and I collect the speckle on this side, I can display on my special light modulator an image and I can try to now guess what it was from, uh, from this output speckle. So this would be, I am, I am behind the scattering, I, am, I'm, I show an object and I try to guess what it is, okay? Which is not the same as focusing through the medium. And the, there is a simple uh, way to do it, which is basically uh, try to inverse the problem. It's an inverse problem. And then what you want to do is basically apply to the output field an operator that is, for instance, h minus 1 to inverse the, pro the, 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 pro the, 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 pro the problem and go back to your original object. But if you do that, h minus 1 doesn't work because h minus 1 is usually noisy. So the, your measurement is noisy, so H minus one doesn't work. H dagger phase conjugation works better, but not very well because it's not exactly H minus one, so except if your system is unitary. So it's a, it's, a, it's a good way, but it's not the best way. And probably the reason for that is interesting to discuss. H minus one doesn't work because it has small, because eigenvalues are inverted. So if you have just a little bit of noise and a low eigenvalue, you will, uh, you will basically uh, have a huge contribution in the reconstruction, and it will basically uh, be noisy. And here, edge dagger, the eigenvalues are, transpo are transposed, so the small eigenvalue remains small, noise remains small, and the high eigenvalue are just conjugated. Okay, so I just want to show you that you, you have an optimum that uh, is in inverse problem is well known, it's so-called Tikhonov regularization. You can introduce an operator that is some kind of optimal uh, be, between, uh, between the uh, between uh, transpose conjugate and inversion, and that takes into account the noise. So if it's a, a, this operator, and you can see sigma is a noise regularization parameter, and if you, you can see that if you re, if you put if you set sigma sigma to zero, so if you have no noise, this operator reduced to h minus one. So it tells you that uh, h minus one should work while if you put it to a very high value, the best to, to reconstruct is the phase conjugate, okay? So in a way, it means reconstructing the object, exploiting at best uh, your channel in presence of noise, okay? Just to show you some results, uh, I, have, I display this on my special light modulator. This is the speckle that I recover, and I try to, rec to recover by doing H minus one, so the, I just uh, don't recover anything. The correlation is very low. If I now use <coughs> phase conjugation, it's slightly better. And if I now use regularization, it's much better. So this optimal operator. And just want to show you maybe one more thing is that if you measure um, more pixels at the output than at the input, and if you assume a totally random matrix, there is an interesting prediction, a random matrix theory still predicts the distribution of the eigenvalue, but the, the distribution of the eigenvalue change as a function of this ratio of output to, to input size of your random matrix. And in particular, the, this quarter circle law is valid when you take a square random matrix. And when you take a square random matrix, you have some eigenvalues that are close to zero. But if you now measure more output pixel that you have input pixel, you, the distribution changes and rapidly become picked around one. So which means that the noise, basically the, the singular value distribution detach from zero, which means that you will, you will have much less sensitivity to noise because you can invert, okay? 
And this is just to show you that as you change the ratio of output pixel, uh, you can see that the red curve is the, gives the correlation as a function of this ratio. And you can see that the, for a ratio of one, inverse doesn't work at all. But if you start to increase this ratio, the inverse and the Tikhonov gives you basically exactly the same thing. Okay, so you can reconstruct better. Okay. Um, <coughs> So you have less sensitivity to noise. Okay, just very quickly, I just want to point out that you can also control the polarization of the states. Yes, uh, and uh, I will not go further. And there, there is uh, some, some, uh, some uh, nice work we did about the temporal aspects of light, but I will stop here for today and we'll continue next week with uh, the mesoscopic uh, aspects and how to unravel or uh, exploit them. Thank you very much. You, you said that the three methods are similar. Yes. But uh, one of them, uh, you, you described, only uses maximization of intensities, whereas the other take into consideration both intensities and phase. So you have more information in, in, in some of the, of the uh, methods than the others. How can they be comp uh, Yes, identical? so they are not, uh, they are, let's say they are in principle equivalent. So they all amount at the end of the day to generate uh, a focus that is basically a constructive interference. And now there are some mi minor change, um, difference depending on what uh, system exactly uh, uh, you are using. For instance, if you are using a phase modulator, you can only control the phase, the constructive interference, so you can only change the phase between the different phasors, but not their amplitude. So in optimization or transmission optimization, you typically control only the phase. In uh, Digital phase conjugation, you control amplitude and phase. In transmission matrix, it depends what you use, but you can, it can be either. Uh, but there is an interesting point that actually controlling phase and amplitude or only phase is just a factor two in noise. So you will get uh, basically the same result. It will just be slightly uh, uh, better or worse, but it will be the same result up to a prefactor.